Hello and welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. Now, engineers love to solve problems and not just have problems solved for them. The reason? Well, we like to look under the hood and see how the engine is built and operates. However, the reality is that your own team's engineering capacity is limited and at some point you may need to draw upon external resources for support. Alternatively, you may be tackling a new application and not have all the required expertise in-house. Of course, using external resources doesn't magic the capacity issue away. The relationship between yourselves and your chosen partner must be managed, requiring not only good time, uh, not only um, time from uh, your busy day, but also good communication, preparation and planning. So to learn more about how to get the best out of an outsourcing relationship for the development of electronics applications, my experts for this episode are Petr Dvorak, a freelance hardware designer, and Frantisek Vrbovsky um, from ASN Plus. So Petr, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Hello Stuart, thank you for having me. You're welcome. So could you tell us and the audience briefly about yourself and the sort of projects that you tackle? Yeah, thank you. I am a hardware design engineer, freelancing hardware design engineer, uh, working from the beautiful city of Brno in the Czech Republic, in European Union. And I offer hardware design services uh, to customers from all around the world. Uh, yeah, from their ideas to prototypes to independent manufacturing data. So I help them to fulfill their dreams and to make their products as, as they want. Sounds great. Uh, sounds like the sort of job I, I would have loved to have if I'd uh, gone a different career path. That's for sure. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for the introduction. Let's pull it in Frantisek as well. Hi there, Frantisek. Hello, Stuart. I am Frantisek Wrobowski. Thanks for invitation. Uh, as you said correctly, I work for ASM Plus, which is a company based in Brno as well, same as Peter. And uh, I am responsible for the project and business development. So I am my, my field is to guide uh, the new customers and some of the current customers throughout the process of uh, development of the electronics, firmware, software and hardware. Good stuff. Well, I'll be looking forward to coming back to you shortly and digging into some of your experiences and knowledge and sharing that with our audience. I'll see you shortly. Now this episode, oh, sorry. Uh, press the wrong button. There we go. Now, this episode is sponsored by Downstream. Downstream Technologies software helps engineering organizations optimize and automate the PCB release process. Downstream's tools redefine how engineers and PCB designers post-process PCB designs to create and distribute all the deliverables required for a complete assembly release package. Their flagship product, CAM350, provides verification and optimization before designs are transferred to the fabricator, which ensures the successful manufacture of bare PCB boards. Also available is Blueprint PCB, which uses its CAD database to quickly produce comprehensive documentation to drive PCB fabrication, assembly and inspection processes. More information about Downstream can be found at Downstream Tech, that's downstreamtech.com. Now, um, I've never actually had to outsource an electronics design project before, but I have been busy outsourcing other tasks of late. And one of the things I've learned is that preparation is key, along with regular and clear communication. However, this show is about uh, answers to your challenges, so hopefully you've got lots of questions prepared. You can join in the conversation by posting your questions and comments during the show. Simply use the chat function on YouTube and LinkedIn, or tweet us on X using hashtag electorei, that's hashtag electorei, and we'll do our best to get you answers or guide you to resources that might help. So let's welcome Peter and Frantisek back to the show. Uh, there we go, you've uh, swapped places. I don't know why that's the case, but there we go. <laughs> Absolutely fine. So Peter, I'd like to start with you. Um, give us a bit more detail about the types of electronics hardware projects that you work on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, usually these days, uh, devices I'm, I work on are small to mid-size, usually embedded devices containing a microcontroller, uh, sometimes two, but uh, yeah, most of the time, a single microcontroller, usually partnered with a communication device, some sensors and actuators. Uh, this is a typical device I work on. Uh, besides, besides that, I work on power supplies and uh, and motor control devices and and similar things so yeah this is what i do and Francis, the same same to you what's the the sort of care core competency or the core focus of asm plus and the the applications that you develop for your clients mm, thank you uh actually uh our company asm plus um is being seen by by other companies in the Czech Republic and from abroad as well. For example, from Switzerland and from uh, from Netherlands uh, currently the most uh, actually. And the companies come to us to do, to outsource the development services like the hardware, firmware, and these. Uh, actually, they are seeking for for the cost effectivity mostly because they can save up to one third of the costs when they do outsource these things. Uh, secondly, we help them with driving to a result. So, for example, when they come with some kind of a vision, maybe or the structure of the product, they come to us and we are able to guide them through the process of of specification and and these things. Actually, we our field is I would say similar to Peter's. Uh, we work in the embedded systems, like we uh, create embedded and design embedded uh, embedded electronics. We use one to two microcontrollers as well, uh, mostly it's STM, sometimes ESP and this. And uh, I would say our specialization is uh, the communicating electronics. Let's talk about this maybe in in next next growing next questions. Yeah, super. So, friend to shake. If we, if we stay for, with you for a minute, I mean, mm -hmm. ASM Plus it's a, a larger organization, and and a, a several. You know, you've got a team of in, engineers alongside you mm -hmm. there. Um, when someone comes to you and says, "Hey, uh, we've got this project. We don't have the capacity to do it. <laughs> um, we need some help." Um, you'd obviously expect that the BA requirements document they're sketching out basically what that device is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what are the key things that really need to be described in that document so that you can provide support as quickly and efficiently as possible? Stuart, it's a great question, but uh, but a little difficult one. Uh, actually, there are two types of customers who come to our, our doors with, with a request for outsourcing. The first one is the company uh, who has no experiences regarding the outsourcing and hardware development. So mostly what we provide to them is the know-how, how to do it and know how what's 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 real what can be done. Sometimes the expectations are not realistic and we have to discuss with uh, with the customers what can be done and how what can be cost effective and what makes sense. So for these customers, the process of the uh, of the specification it's much more complex, and we ordinarily do it like during the first one, two, or three meetings. We create sometimes workshops to discuss really the expectations from the customer and what can be done. The second type of the customer, which is uh, I would say a customer who has experiences with our sourcing electronics, and at the same time having the experience of the hardware development or electronics development in general, these companies can they address us with the specifications of what should be done or what is the goal. So ordinary, they expect some kind of a communication. So for example, we want to use the Bluetooth, we want to use the Wi-Fi. Mostly the better way is to, to go through the concept. So for example, we want to do the communication between this piece and this piece or communication with the electronics and the mobile phone, for example, or, or the web app or something. And then we can uh, search for or maybe choose the correct uh, technology, correct framework or, or the suitable, suitable way how to communicate. If it's going to be Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cord, or something so so that's maybe the goal or where they want to get it. it's better and it's more important than than maybe the way of, of specifying like uh, uh, um, every note or maybe every point how it should be done 
and then Petr, the same same to you. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think you you work with a larger team, but mostly work on your own. If if, if and if that's correct, I mean, do you approach it differently when you're uh, talking to a customer for the first time and, and clarifying exactly what they need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I usually work on my own uh, without any team, so just me. And there are similarities uh, what Francesca described. Uh, definitely. Uh, I would uh, I would say that uh, there are two types of customers as well. I would say that uh, the first group has some experience with hardware development and the second one uh, doesn't. And uh, the usual message to the to the uh, unexperienced group is uh, t I would say I, I always say tell me everything, all your ideas, what, what do you want to achieve? Uh, let's make a video call and you will describe me your, your, your ideas, your, your goals. And uh, I will prepare a project proposal based on your requirements and, uh, and continually we will increase to the, to the state where we can start. Uh, with the first group of experienced, for example, freelancers or small company representatives, the situation is somehow simple, simpler because uh, they they know how things uh, go, and uh, yeah, they usually have prepared some documents with listed requirements, numbers, everything. So the situation is somehow uh, less difficult. But but uh, both sides have their pros and cons. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I can imagine there's, there's sort of no one size fits all answer, but I think both of you have uh, sort of clarified the same, the same point that goes on in any company is that you obviously have to sit down and start to collect as much information as possible and, and clarify it. Now, once that sort of those initial discussions have taken place, Peter, um, and you've sort of signed off on, on, a, on a series of requirements that allows you to get started. Obviously, some things may change later on in the project. How, how does the project proceed? How do you make sure the client is informed on a regular basis about the status? Are there any sort of tools that you use which help with that process? Or, or do you sort of keep it simple and, and just have weekly calls and, and weekly emails? Mm -hmm. Most of the time we use emails on a almost daily basis. Uh, I found emails like, yeah, somebody uh, finds finds them old school, but I, I think they they are work, still working and uh, the best way. I don't I don't prefer the instant messaging because it's too, too aggressive way of communication. So we we are on emails. And as I as I said, we we continually uh, yeah, go to the to the end requirements, but uh, the change is is constant in even in hardware development. So, uh, a way of or or the part of my hardware design project proposal, as I said, as I say, is uh, the 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 variant offer uh, for the customers, where the the goal is clear and uh, and well defined, and uh, since the beginning, there is. Uh, an offer with uh, a fixed price and yeah, everything is clear and we can start. For the customers with uh, unknown unknown deliverable, deliverables and uh, something uh, untold and uh, yeah, usually those are the customers without the hardware design the experience. I, I propose uh, a variant uh, with, with the range from within time needed to, to work on the projects, including the, the price range. Because uh, this, is, this is the way I, I try to, to deal with the constant changes coming through the project. Sometimes uh, even the, if the, the board is, is finished and the PCB is, is done and manufacturing data are exported, the customer a customer uh, sent me an email that, and say, yeah, we need to change that and days and something. So I need to, to get back a few days and start basically over. This is normal, but for such kind of, comp of customers, I calculate it with the proposal and the price usually cover the, these kind of situations. Yeah, exactly. Now, I think that's always a challenge in any freelance environment. It's, 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 uh, it's nice to 
pass a project off to somebody, but <laughs> as a freelancer, you're never really sure exactly how long everything's going to take. Um, and there's, there has to be, I think, a little bit of give and take in that relationship. Uh, Frantishek, how is it for you and, and your team? Do you have any sort of project management tools that you use internally that you can also share externally with clients to sort of keep them informed and, and uh, make sure everybody knows the status? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you for the question. Uh, actually, we do it a little in a different way than Peter. Uh, we uh, we much more, I would say, are used uh, to have uh, weekly meetings. So we have really deep uh, weekly meetings for half an hour to one and a half hour to discuss really in deep uh, the things that should be done during the next week. Uh, and we have it like on a weekly basis, as I said. Then we as well have uh, mail communication, which we use for specifying some things which are really important and should be in a written form. And uh, in the third stage, we, we have the WhatsApp messages of uh, groups uh, or hangout uh, groups for, for discussing like things maybe which, which are in a hurry or should be uh, solved like maybe in a, in a quite uh, shorter time. Uh, actually, for us, it's very important uh, not to have too many projects. So we have something between two to six project at the, projects at the same time. So we are having really intensive communication with the customers. We have uh, we have uh, the communication which which is really maybe on day to day basis. Actually, uh, what I wanted to say uh, is uh, that we want to. Uh, the customers to have, I would say, reserved time for the project as well. So, so if we start a project with some customer, for us it's important that the customer counts on spending some time for this project. So he'll be available for answering the questions. For example, if we if we receive, send an email with some kind of a request or some kind of a, a request for adding information from the customer, and we would wait, for example, for one or two weeks, it's not the way we would we would like to work so we are we are trying pretty hard in the in the beginning to discuss uh, that that uh, we need some capacity of the customer as well and we are going through the project so we work on this intensive communication and we create the invoicing from two to four weeks ordinary it's two weeks so so the customer is really in track of doing all these things yeah. at, at the real time no, super. I think that sort of highlights as well the the different ways that freelance um, support can can operate um, depending on you know the, the 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 size of the team as well. Obviously, with Peter um, work, working essentially on on his own uh, and handling projects um, in in his way, but obviously with Francis uh, ASN Plus, you've got more capacity and obviously more projects going on parallel. So. Uh, that that tight relationship, obviously, and, and the communication is is very um, important. Now, um, Frantishek, um, one one of the challenges, obviously, is um, developing the product that's been requested. Mm -hmm. But the the next thing that comes along is to actually then manufacture that product at some point. How mm -hmm. do you make sure that the hardware you're developing is also capable of being tested? when it's being manufactured. What sort of things need to be considered? I mean, thinking also with the mm -hmm. microcontroller needs to be programmed end of line, some initial testing to prove it works. Mm -hmm. What's your approach there and, and what do you recommend to customers? Thank you for another great and juicy question. Actually, what we do is ordinary that we really develop the devices which I would say maybe uh, did not exist yet. So we create really the design and after design is created, we want to create the prototypes. We do not do this uh, in-house. We have uh, manufacturing partners, for example, for the PCB manufacturing, secondly, for the assembly, like the mounting. And once the assembly is done of the, of the created PCB, it is being delivered to our company and then we are testing it ourselves. So we create the testing, the testing software, we create the tools for the testing of the, of the hardware and we do it on our own. So the only one who, who is able to, I would say, reveal or find out that there is some kind of a problem which was done during the manufacturing is our company. So after we get the information, what's for example, of the small series, it's two to three to five pieces, it depends, but it's not that we create for the first time, for example, 50 pieces. It would be it would be really tricky and, and risky. Uh, so we create that that small uh, amount of the of the devices. 
we test it, and if there is some kind of a uh, issue which was done uh, in the manufacturing, then we are discussing whether it's the manufacturing <coughs> problem of the process or or maybe the thing which can be avoided by change of the design or or redesign in a small way. So after it, we connect or, or we get in touch really closely again with the manufacturer and we are discussing how to avoid these things when we want to go, for example, for the serial production or, or more pieces production in the tens of the pieces. Super. Um, Peter, is, is that the same for you as, as well? Have you got um, sort of specific manufacturers that you work with or do you let your, your client determine where it's going to be manufactured and then you have to make sure you've, you've uh, developed a, a testing process um, mm -hmm. that, that matches the, their needs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the smaller, smaller part of the, of the customers uh, wants me to, to, to cooperate with manufacturing. So in that case, I know the, the manufacturing company and I immediately get in touch with the, the com manufacturing company representatives and, and talk about their requirements, uh, size of the test points, for example, and uh, positions of them and on which sides of the board and all the details. And the other, other, and the rest of the customers uh, manufacture their their projects, their products outside of my of my reach on on their own. So I I use the best practices uh, for the design and to as as I said to 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 use as many test points as possible on a, on a good point good on top side preferably uh, zero ohm resistors, solder jumpers, yeah, usual best practices. To, to enable the manufacturing later because I'm not uh, in touch with the with the manufacturing company. So yeah, and sometimes they they get back to me for the revision when uh, something needs to be changed. And yeah, I say okay, sure, we will change it and prepare a revision for them. Yeah, super. Now um, one of the sort of big challenges that can really um, cause problems in a project is is um, the standards that have to be fulfilled. And one of them I'm thinking of is EMC, this electromagnetic compatibility. Um, but there's also other things maybe for medical appliances and then there's automotive standards for vehicles and, and commercial vehicles and things like that. Um, Peter, at, at what point do you sort of need to know what standards need to be considered and, and what is it you're doing during the development process to make sure um, that you know you you'll be able to pass those tests when the product is finished. Yeah, yeah, a great question. The, those uh, those info, those facts needs to be known at the very beginning of the project during the the project proposal because this is the this is this these are the factors I I use to 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 decide if I am able to to deliver the product to the customer or not. For example, speak, when speaking of medical devices, I uh, need to to say thank you for the for the inquiry, but I am not able to to design it because it's outside of my expertise. I I openly say it because uh, I don't design something I I don't understand. So yeah, this is mm -hmm. this is the state. But when speaking of EMC and uh, some uh, similar things, I can. Uh, I can design for for meet their the requirements of the standards at the very beginning of the project because it's uh, it's crucial and it's uh, the cost driver somehow cost driver of the project. Exactly. Now I think that's very fair and it's and it's good to be clear. I think in in advance as to what is possible and, and what areas of expertise you have available and, and which ones uh, you know you, you're not able to tackle. Especially in, in medical, for example, it can be very challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, there's a lot of work behind that goes behind that, making yourself even um, certifiable to maybe be part of the design and manufacturing process. How is it with with uh, your team, Frantisek? Uh, and, and do you have like the EM, EMC measurement capability in house to do some um, at least sort of um, pre um, pre testing before uh, the product's finished? Mm -hmm. Yes. No. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, for the first thing, uh, as Peter said, it's very important and I would say crucial to mention all these things like regarding uh, the standards that, it, that the customer wants to meet 
regarding the field where where the device should be uh, should be aiming. So, firstly, what we don't do as well is the um, is the medical applications. For example, what we do is uh, the applications for the automotive industry, uh, which is under the uh, one of the standards is two, uh, ISO 26262. Uh, what we do really in the beginning is getting through the standard and uh, make a lot of notes when the application should be done. For example, one of our projects right now, there was a setting before the project even started, there was a 40 parameters of these ISO, which has to be met during the development. So it's really important to me discuss and mention these things in the very beginning, uh, because there is no, I would say, worse, a worse way than, than uh, to mention some of these things when the prototype is done, for example, before the testing. And if you do not keep this information in a do in head during the development, it, it can be really, it can be, it can mean that you have to start with the design from the very beginning. Second question is the EMC testing. Definitely, it uh, we can do a lot of testing, but actually we do not do this testing in house. We use the laboratories, which are actually next to our offices in uh, in the university VUT or the military testing labs in Vyshkov, which is, I would say, maybe 20, 20 30 kilometers from Brno. So we use very specialized uh, specialized places for these testings. So we can get, I would say, homogene, uh, the, the standard the results from this testing. I think, that, I mean, that's that's really important. It's help, helpful to have those laboratories close by. There's a, one of the companies I work with on a regular basis. They they have a certain amount of in-house capability there. But again, there's a huge cost associated with creating that and um, and operating it as well. So uh, um, I think uh, think you're in quite a lucky position, Frantisek. <laughs> now, one of the, yeah. the big topics, I think, um, sort of during the corona crisis and, and post-COVID, um, everybody's been talking about um, component supply. My feeling is at the minute that um, you know compo the component supply issue is, is largely passed and, and things are starting to come back to a certain amount of normality. Pieter, um, how is it for you? Are, are you still seeing problems with components being available? And how do you go about making sure that you are designing in components which will still be available when manufacturing should start. Yeah, yeah. Those times were, were crazy during the, the corona crisis. Uh, yeah, the lack of the unavailability to, to, of components and lack of components was was a yeah was a driver for constant redesigns. I I, I remember that uh, I worked for a company here in Brno, and we we made we have to we had to make uh, a few revisions, like four revisions before we were able to 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 assemble all all to assemble the entire entire product because uh, along the way along the during the manufacturing process there was some some something always was, was missing so i i did uh, like three to four revisions to 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 be able to to manufacture the boards and uh, my my way of work is that i uh, always uh, choose from the the most available components all the time. I used only trust for the suppliers like uh, Mouse Electronics, uh, Digikey, and Farnell, and I sort all the all the components from uh, from the yeah, the most available to, to the least ones, and I always choose from the most available ones and uh, I put them into my component library. And I have I'm lucky. I have to say I'm lucky that uh, during the last well, two years, not two years, one and a half year, the situation is uh, somehow stable, has been stable. And uh, yeah, I I choose from always from the most uh, available ones. And uh, yeah, I knock the, knock the table, knock the, door, knock the wood. Uh, the situation is good and uh, yeah, no, no revisions for the, for the unavailability anymore. Sounds sounds like things things have improved, and it's good to hear that from somebody who is uh, facing that challenge on a daily basis. Uh, Frantisek, are there any um, Czech um, um, bringers of luck um, that you rub on a daily basis to uh, to hope that uh, it helps make sure the component supply is there? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm looking uh, as as this, in the same way as Peter is on a wood. 
uh, because I would say, uh, for example, uh, four or five years ago, uh, when we were creating the design, there was no, not that big need or huge need of of checking the components availability. A lot of components which were using we, we were using on a properly basis, uh, it was it was free available. But after uh, maybe the corona crisis and some things regarding maybe the fire in the in the com one of the companies, uh, one of the manufacturers, which was one of the biggest in the world, um, this issue came. We were hit really, I would say, in a hard way. So, so we already, for example, some of the of the components, for example, the STM was available after maybe ten months of from the ordering. So. It is really a big issue when you want to create some kind of a design and you want to test it and then you want to proceed to the, for example, serial production and you are lacking of this kind of crucial components, which would, what a microcontroller is, it's kind of a really big issue. So what we keep in mind and we create, a, I would say, we can call it a risk table of the components and we create a table of for in the beginning of every design before the design is even started and we put there like the colors what kind of component is available on the market what is in a risk of lacking or not availability in the market and we put all these informations there and then once we start the design and we are really and we are uh, we want to integrate this component there we have to get these things on stock and we are we are discussing with the customers that there is a need of uh, creating a stock of, of the crucial components and we are creating it during the design even during the first stage of the design yeah it, it's a it's a similar approach I've, I've heard from other people is you know as soon as the design started they're they're making sure they've got reels of um you know hd converters op amps regulators voltage regulators what you know whatever looks like it might be a bit difficult to get hold of later just to make sure they can uh, if, if nothing else get through the prototyping phase without any issues so yeah some great advice in there thank you very much so um frantishik uh, peter i'm just going to take you out the show for a moment uh hold, stay in the line because we're going to be coming back to you after we've done our giveaway and uh, ask you some more questions about uh, freelance uh, hardware design and, and how you guys uh, help uh, help customers. See you shortly. See you. So as I said, it's giveaway time. Now, previously in our last show, we gave away a copy of AI at the Edge, which is written by two Edge Impulse engineers, Daniel Sitanayaka and Jenny Plunkett. Congratulations go to Pascal, who won a copy. Your prize should be on its way. Now to extend our thanks to you as Loyal Engineering Insights viewers, for this episode I have another book on offer. Circuit Simulation by Professor Dr. Dogan Ibrahim covers the design and analysis of electrical and electronic circuits. To support these topics, the book includes access to Tina Cloud, a simulation environment from DesignSoft, which supports both analog and digital circuit analysis. For your chance to win a copy, simply visit the link shown below and enter the keyword outsourcing. That's the keyword outsourcing with your entry. And we wish you all the best of luck. So let's get back to our guests. We have Frantisek and Petr with us, and uh, you've changed places again. Surprise, surprise, <laughs> this is really exciting. I never know what's going to happen next. <laughs> now, we're going to get onto a topic now which is very close to my heart, and I know a lot of our um, regular Elector readers and viewers uh, will agree with that, and that's the topic of microcontrollers. Um, both of you um, support microcontrollers. You said in the introductions there that um, you know, most of the designs have at least one microcontroller on them. Um, Peter, I'd ask you to start and say which are the preferred microcontrollers that you work with and uh, you know, why, why are they the ones that you go to first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, without, uh, for first, without naming uh, the name of the manufacturers, I, I would like to say that the, the manufacturing support and documentation is a must for a microcontroller to be used. Once the documentation is uh, uh, once the documentation is is in bad quality or missing or or the support of the customer is uh, is slow and uh, it's a it's a no go for me. So uh, I choose from the usual suspects. Uh, I can name uh, ST. 
NXP, Renaissance, uh, Nordic Semiconductor, uh, Texas Instruments, so probably I say. Uh, yeah, those, those suspects, because uh, their support is uh, excellent, documentation perfect, uh, availability these days better than, than before. And uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that uh, I chose only from Western, the, the Western designed components. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's quite a broad range of suppliers. I mean, I, I've worked for TI, I've worked for Microchip, I've worked for Atmel, and I've worked for National Sem Semiconductor, all of whom, um, you know, when, when they existed as, as well, had, had microcontrollers. How do you personally manage to sort of stay on top of so many different processes, so many architectures, so many tool chains and, mm -hmm. and libraries? Yeah, the situation is uh, known for all the designers and as well for manufacturers. And they help us big time. Their reference designs, they do, their documentation, their edu uh, evaluation kits. Uh, we can, th this is where we, where we can start from and adapt to our, uh, to our projects and designs. So uh, for example, Texas Instruments uh, and their reference designs or, or ST or Nordic Semiconductor with excellent documentation. Uh, it's a it's a big helper, and uh, uh, I don't want to to uh, say it incorrectly, but uh, all those microcontrollers are somehow similar. There is uh, no outlier in the, in the in the families I mentioned. So once you manage to to implement uh, a microcontroller of the ARM Cortex M, let's say four family, uh, the requirements are mostly similar among all family, all manufacturers. So this is plus for us. Yeah, exactly. Now, I think that's a, a, a good point. I mean, the industry has changed massively from when I started. We, you know, we were sitting there arguing about which 8-bit core was, was the best approach uh, or which, you know, should we move to a 16-bit core and, and lots of benchmark testing to, to compare workload on different architectures. And, and like you say, the, um, with a majority of, of suppliers uh, using uh, um, uh, Cortex M cores from ARM, um, it sort of simplified at least the pro the processor part of the, of the microcontrollers. Uh, Frantichik, how is it in your organisation? What sort of um, what number of microcontroller architectures or, or suppliers do you support? Mm -hmm. uh, we have experiences definitely with integrating, as, as Peter said, it's, it's the similar, similar microcontrollers from Texas Instruments, uh, Nordic Semiconductors, but mostly, for example, uh, ESP as well, but mostly uh, we use the SDM as, as we have a really good experience with this. And we want to do, uh, want to go, I would say, way of specializing into maybe one or two types of the, of the microcontrollers as, as um, for example, we, we definitely, when we create the specification or we uh, are guiding for the specification of the customer, we discuss definitely the things of the connection, what technologies do they want to use. For example, if, you, if they want to use DSP, there is integrated the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. If you use, for example, the STM, STM32, you have to have the peripherals for the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. But we are going in a way of integrating of the STM uh, in the Pro, in a similar projects, for example, because we are getting more and more effective in, in, in I would say, integrating the libraries, using the libraries, integrating, for example, M MBIO, M MBDOs, MBD, MDOs, yeah, <laughs> sorry for the pronunciation. Yeah, so, so we are much more getting in the way of specializing in one or two microcontrollers, so, uh, so we know really the best way how to, how to work with them. Uh, but but I wouldn't say for the beginning that that we would deny any other microcontrollers. We have experiences with that as well. But mostly it comes from the customer when they come, for example, with a really exact expectation. We want to integrate Nordic Semiconductor. We do not have problem with that. But but our experience and our expertise is, for example, in the STM and these. Is it interesting? I think that the landscape has improved a, a lot over the years since um, uh, over the last, at least the last 30 years I've, I've been in the industry. Frantischek, do you think that microcontroller suppliers, are, are they doing a good job and sort of working hard enough to make sure the development tools remain up to standard, that their documentation is clear, 
the, the libraries, I think, is, is one of the big challenges, these APIs that they mm -hmm. offer um, and, the, and the support. Uh, or, or, or do you think there's a bit of room for improvement still? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's maybe much more question for some of our software developers because I'm, I would say, much more a user of these technologies and much more a uh, decision maker regarding what uh, what uh, what technology to use. But as I discussed it with with uh, our our team, uh, they were they've been saying that, for example, the STM uh, they have a really good documentation. They have, I would say, right now, good availability on the market. But the issue that we are having is, for example, the the HAL is like the, the hardware abstraction layer. Uh, the integration of some of the components in my, my, might be tricky. And for example, there is a need of changing uh, some things in the library. So that's why we are, for example, integrating the MBDOS. So as, as I said. Yeah, exactly. I, I th and I think that's sort of um, maybe a missed opportunity ac across the industry. You know, um, there's so much standardization um, going on. Um, it sort of makes sense to have a, a, a standardized hardware abstraction layer um, so that you can switch between processors more easily. Um, but again, you know, it's a question of uh, who wants to be first and do it. And there's also, I think, a little bit of people holding back within the embedded systems industry because we're always aware of how much flash and how much RAM as uh, are these extra software la layers going to take up. We don't want to have more software than uh, we really want, you know, despite the fact you know, you get a megabyte of flash and 256K mm. of RAM quite often uh, in, in microcontrollers these days. How is it for you, Peter? What's your opinion on um, how the industry is doing with their microcontroller support software and libraries? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, it, uh, it's getting better and better uh, all, all the, yeah, since especially the last year, uh, ex exactly uh, one year ago when the, the chat GPT and uh, similar similar tools was uh, was released and, and published. The situation I think changed, and uh, all major manufacturers of uh, microcontrollers are fighting for for the for the yeah with uh, releasing the AI supporting t toolboxes and frameworks and everything. So the situation changed, and there is a competition who will be the the best in, in the field of AI this, because AI is, the, I think, the driver of these days. So this is what I noticed. Yeah, now, I think we also had a discussion uh, the other day with some people about the, the role of AI in engineering. And I, I think, um, you know, things are going to change and we're going to have to learn how to, to best leverage it in, in the future. And I think especially in documentation, um, finding answers, it's going to be perhaps um, a, an, Im an improvement over the, the, the search functions that uh, most, cus um, most suppliers have offered uh, for their uh, software. So uh, um, I think there's a, a lot to look forward to there. And talking of change as well, um, Petter, have, have you had a chance to explore Rust as an alternative to C or C++? Or um, is that something that any of your clients have been talking to you about? Uh, I have to admit that I haven't had a chance to explore the, the Rust for microcontrollers. Uh, when speaking of, for example, MicroPython or Circuit Python, I did and I have, but uh, Rust uh, I have never touched. And what do you think of, of MicroPython then as, as an alternative? Um, do, do you see that as, as being just a niche for certain types of applications or is that a realistic alternative? Yeah, still some something like a niche because uh, it's quite demanding for for the power of the microcontroller and especially memory. Memory footprint of the of the foot of the Python is quite big because it's an interpreted language. But uh, especially for for uh, youngsters, for young uh, firmware designers, it's 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 uh, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting because. Uh, uh, they somehow tend to to use the higher languages than than the assembly or C or even C plus plus. So I think it's a future for them because the the code can be significantly uh, lower in the line count, and uh, yeah, the 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 most of the time can be done by the framework or libraries or something like. So I think it's a it's a future for the for the embedded world. Yeah, like uh, electronics. How's how's it looking at uh, ASM plus? <laughs> to be honest, uh, 
we work mostly in C++ and but to be honest the C and C++ these both of the languages are a little uh, please don't be angry about me a little obsolete it's it's languages with, which were created a long time ago and I think that it's the right time to maybe to evolve to uh, to the, the languages which adapt much more to the to the request and the situation that we are facing right now. Actually, uh, we, uh, we try to work and um, one of our uh, programmers uh, tried to work in a Rust, but, but mostly we have to integrate really the code in the C++ uh, because a lot of the standards which we have to meet, for example, for the automotive and these, uh, they are counting on being created in the private, uh, in languages such as C++. So, so as it seems like the electronics is the, is the field which everything is possible and there is a lot of innovations in every step. Sometimes this field is very traditional and this, especially when you have to meet some kind of a standard. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think uh, like anything, it will take time to transition. I, I can't see um, in the next decade uh, C and C++ ev evaporating completely from embedded systems. <laughs> But um, I mean, I think Rust is a very good candidate and we've talked about this um, Rust on the show before. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how that goes and also to stay in touch and find out uh, how things change. So we're getting close towards the end of the show. If you have any questions for my guests today, feel free to uh, contribute them because they're here and they can answer your questions straight away as we're uh, a live stream show. We do have one question here from Maya Makes. I'm just going to pull it up on the screen for you. Um, Mayor Makes asks, how do you deal with clients that do not know about the harsh realities of electronics design? Um, I'm going to put that to Peta first, and it's something that I've experienced as well. I, I had a gentleman in a training course once, and um, he came to learn about how to program microcontrollers, but had no electronics background, no programming background at all and had quite a complex uh, application that you wanted to implement. And to go from nothing to wanting to produce an electronic system, that's an enormous jump. How do you help people with that challenge, Peter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to say, hello, Mayor. How are you? Uh, it's uh, it's my, my mate from, from LinkedIn, we, we know each other. Uh, never mind. Uh, how, do, how do I deal with clients that do not know about the harsh realities of electronic designs? Yeah, well, as I tried to explain, I try to educate them, to explain everything, to explain all needs, all requirements, what uh, what uh, the product, what the hardware design pro, uh, process uh, works, how how it works, and what what will be needed, what I need, what are requirements, what are deliverables, what tool do I use, what manufacturing data will I, exp will I export, and uh, yeah, to educate. To explain, to to talk with them, to to make video calls, to make calls, to to this to yeah to clear the vision for them. And uh, during the the project proposal, when I count hours I need to to full, to deliver the project, I had I have to count with some pillows, with some some yeah some some range in cost because uh, I have to count with issues with misunderstandings and with everything so i count with some pillows and to 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 offer uh, the 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 project proposal with some price and if the the customer say yes let's do it i have some pillows some some reserves in the in the budget and uh, i can i can deal with the with, with the issues that that are yeah, going to to come I think there's a, a nice bit of uh, advice and a good uh, overview of, of uh, how you approach that. I'm, I'm guessing, Frantishek, that Maya Makes has um, had this problem in the past. What, what would you uh, recommend to help them uh, tackle this sort of challenge? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I am uh, almost with the same mind as Peter is. Actually, we, we face some from time to time some customers who has I would say a naive ex expectations because they do not have like experiences what the hardware development is. They we have a kind of a I would say fairy tale or some kind of a joke uh, which we are discussing and telling uh, in the company that some of the customers they ex they expect that the hardware hardware design and hardware development is something like you get a pot 
And you put there, for example, the technologies, you put a Wi-Fi module, Bluetooth module, microcontroller, then you mix it with a spoon. And after one week, you have created a really embedded system and embedded design, which is debugged and which can work and you can put it on the market. It's kind of a funny, funny joke, but sometimes the expectations really in, in the way uh, of really serious ones, uh, some of the customers, they do not have the expectations and sometimes they have expectations which are quite lower than the reality. For example, expectation regarding the hours, which is needed for the hardware design and the way. They sometimes expect that the way is going to be like straightforward, but sometimes, as Peter said, you have to go back for two steps. You have to change some things and then create a prototype and then you have to do the redesigns. And for example, some of the companies which we are working with, they get into a reliable, a reliable working device after, for example, 20 iterations. It sometimes depends. Uh, it sometimes happens. So we try to do the same as Peter. We try to educate them with, I would say, with love, because we want to understand their, their, their expectations and their situation and their opinions. And we want to tell them and educate them how it works like in a, during design and development. And sometimes it's hard, but, but it's the processes as it is. I think that's a very fair summary. And I like your idea of having a, a pot there where we, we chuck in a few modules, give it a stir, <laughs> something, <laughs> something comes out. Um, that brings me on to my, my next question, really, because I, I think one of the challenges, um, the reason we're doing the show and have you on the show is obviously because those are the, the, the things that we need to discuss, we need to explain and in, inform how electronics becomes into being and how long it takes and how complicated it can be and all the standards that need to be fulfilled. I think my, maybe one of the reasons um, people have that sort of um, expectation that Maya makes as, as described is there are so many module suppliers these days. We've got Adafruit, we've got SparkFun, we've got MicroE. Um, Peter, do, do you actually use those suppliers and uh, to sort of develop prototypes? Do you find them helpful to have that collection of modules at, at your fingertips? Yeah, I love them. I love them. They are ingenious. I use them. My customers use them. And uh, it's the very frequent state that um, the new prospect customer uh, comes to me with uh, some pre-designed project based on such modules with uh, Arduino and some micro microbus uh, interfaces, modules, clickboards, and uh, and uh, Adafruit boards. And uh, the reason is simple: all those companies you mentioned are uh, are open source, or they, they 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 provide us with documentation, with schematics, and with with uh, all we need as a designer. So it's a it's a pleasure to work with such a modules, which are such a companies as Adafruit, yeah, Arduino. Spark fun, uh, yeah, I love them as I said, and uh, I, I, I hope I will use them in the future as as I do now. What what's it like at ASM Plus, Frantisek? Have you got a, a collection of, uh, of of these boards lying around for the team? Yeah, we like this as well. Uh, mostly, we get uh, in touch with uh, with these, for example, with the Raspberry Pi, Arduino boards, and these when the customer they create some kind of prototype and they address us with they want to, for example, they want to substitute like this this module with with the really microcontrol and the and really other other things which we they want to pre create recreate the embedded uh, embedded board with all together with. With, for example, microcontrol. So we use them sometimes, but mostly we uh, we substitute these with with the design that is created. Uh, but we like them as well. We have a lot of experience with, for example, Raspberry Pi. Uh, but again, there is a, a little problem with, for example, availability, and it can be a little little tough to sometimes get the ones we want to. So uh again it's it's the same as the other components maybe on the market availability is crucial it's, it's interesting that you mentioned arduino and also uh raspberry pi there as well um are you seeing that sort of um youngsters next generation engineers are are getting started with with those sort of platforms do, do you think they're helping us as an industry to encourage more people uh into the type of work we do frantisek Definitely, definitely. I would advise to everybody uh, to use these things maybe in the beginning because it's 
according to our experience, it's sometimes the fastest way to get the working prototype. So uh, when they want, for example, some of the youngsters want to create some kind of a design, then they want to do the proof of concept and they, they, can, they want to get to the working device. These modules is, is the fastest way to where to get, or how to get there. What about yourself, Peter? I, I guess you, you sort of see these as a positive uh, change to how uh, maybe you learned to program and get into microcontrollers. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I agree 100% with Franciszek. I would uh, only what I can add is that, yeah, I I noticed that the the younger gener generation and the representatives of the of the yeah the the youngest generation somehow tends to use the higher level languages and computer like uh, environment. And this is, for example, Raspberry Pi offer perfectly. So this is the the new the new standard, I think. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity in breaking down barriers. And I, I think it'd be interesting to to look at the um, the workforce in 10 years time and, and see um, if, you know, Raspberry Pi, Arduino and things like the micro bit have, have really had the uh, the impact on, on the industry and uh, the, the workforce that uh, that we're hoping for. So we're coming to the last few minutes of the show. What I wanted to do before we wrap up, um, one, a couple of more questions. So Petter, is there any uh, any interesting projects that you're working on at the minute? Any interesting challenges that you can tell us about? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would start with the, the challenges or about uh, one challenge. It's not the, uh, the connected with hardware design, but somehow is. Uh, I, as I said, I offer my hardware design services to the customers from around the world. And recently I worked for a company from New Zealand and there is a 12 hour time shift between my time zone and their time zone. And this was, uh, this was kind of funny, but uh, this was the, the most difficult communication I ever experienced because I have to, I had to wait at least a day for a response to, to my email because uh, I work from, from like 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. and uh, 6 a.m in the morning was there 6 p.m. So they they was at home, not in, in, in an office. So it was like funny situation, but we can't meet meet together on online meeting or anywhere. So it was like quite challenging situation and uh, the exciting projects. I want to mention the, the Prusa development company. Uh, the the fun, funny fact is that I started uh, like six years ago with the company Russia development. It was uh, the, the company was my first ever customer. Then I were I had worked for them for three years with, uh, before I, I stopped. And then uh, this year I, I we yeah we refreshed our co cooperation and I I I have been working for them uh, again. And uh, they they gave me the knowledge uh, in KiCad. They 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 show, showed me uh, what's KiCad, how to use it, and uh, they started my my freelancing career the the correct way. So I would like to say thank to them. This is a really good open source company. And uh, yeah, currently I worked on a new device for a new 3D printer. I I'm sorry I can't say more about the project, but uh, yeah, I hope I really hope that we will see it in a new 3D printer by Prusa. Sounds sounds very exciting. How about yourself, Frantisek? What's the team working on at the minute? What's the most sort of exciting um, developments that uh, you're and, and uh, yes, sensing systems that you're developing? Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> I, I forgot that it's the right the right time for <laughs> sending my greetings to my family and all of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one of the projects I wanted to mention is uh, one one of the really juicy ones. Actually, we have been working uh, uh, on this project. It's a Czech project, more than five years, and it's a uh, it's a product which is being sold in ten thousands of pieces every year all around the world, and which is the control unit for. Uh, it's called the Project Leviathan. It's like the creature from the northern mythology, uh, and it's it's uh, a device which controls the airsoft guns functioning. And one of the challenges was there that there is a lot of manufacturers of the airsoft guns and the intestines, the inner inner space of the guns is different. So we had to get there to the same functionality, but the different shapes of the PCBs, the different shapes of the of the place where it where it has to fit. 
So we created right now, right now we are at the stage of existing family of five existing products for this Leviathan device. And we created uh, like all the things which are related to this. So we created the firmware, software, and the applications as well. These applications were created in a Flutter, which is a multi-platform multi -platformer development uh, framework, which is really tasty as well. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these uh, this control unit, it controls the gun, the cadence, the speed of the shooting, the, uh, the shooting burst, and these things. It also collects the data, uh, and it puts this data in the in the mobile phone, in the in the for the Android and iOS. At the same time, uh, you can control it. We are the we are the Android. Uh, Android uh, watches uh, and iOS watches like Apple watches as well. And one of the things which was really tricky was when you have, for example, existing 80,000 of pieces all around the world and you want to do the firmware update, you have to do it like in a remote way. So we integrated the bootloader so every customer can can uh, upload the new firmware via, uh, via the mobile app and these. And we have to be very really careful what, what kind of a what are our features to integrate there in these? So, so it's one of the challenging projects, but we like it. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. It reminds me of one of the first pieces of firmware that I, I ever wrote. It was also a bootloader uh, for um, for a Bluetooth device, actually, sort of 20 years ago. And um, it was integrated into a, a PDA, one of those personal, personal digital assistants, which was like a smartphone without the, the mm -hmm. smartness. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we, we, had to, we had to make sure, of course, that the firmware could be updated without bricking the device because we, we didn't have any spare RAM for, a, for an alternative uh, um, yeah, for an alternative firmware in image. So uh, yeah, that brings back good memories. Thank you. So Frantisek, <laughs> before we go, last question to you. Uh, what advice do you have for anyone wanting a career in a embedded systems or electronics? Have you got any sort of good books, websites, or platforms that you think people should be should be looking at, or what's your recommendation? Yeah, my recommendations are uh, maybe from the first uh, point, the regular ones, for example, to go through the magazines like the PCB Master, PCB, uh, yeah, PCB Master, for example, and PCB Expert, which are online magazines where you can go through like the articles where are described the technologies, how, what to mistakes, for example, avoid when you are creating the PCB design and hardware design in general. That's the one thing, so go through these things. Secondly, um, the very important thing is, for example, to be, to be, uh, to be in a party, for example, or just a close person who live in the hardware electronics design things and the process. So good thing is, for example, to follow really uh, the influencers on a, on a website and on a, on a social sites, for example, as, as Peter Dvořák is. So I do recommend, for example, to follow follow uh, these professionals uh, because they are putting a lot of content in a, in a social media things and social media sites. So this is the thing that I would uh, advise as well. And the third thing, which is really important, not to think twice, but start doing. So really small projects uh, really from small things, which, which don't ha doesn't have to be like kind of a game changers in, 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 in the field, but it's very important to start and not to be afraid of, of maybe to create some kind of, or do some kind of failures in these. It's, it's, it's better to get starting with, with doing some things at their homes and, uh, and it can, they can improve themselves in, in the process. So yeah, some, some good tips there. I think um, also you, you mentioned influencers. Peter is also uh, an influencer on, on LinkedIn. I was looking at his newsletter um, mm -hmm. today and uh, there's some great stuff with the new components and products and some key CAD tips. Uh, what's your recommendation for, for uh, youngsters looking to get into the industry and, and establish themselves, Peter? Yeah, for first, thank you for such a recognition. I, I'm honored by you, gentlemen. Yeah, uh, I would like to add to the to the uh, facts that Pranjik mentioned because I 100% agree with him. I am getting asked quite frequently on LinkedIn by uh, youngsters and uh, uh, fresh graduate engineers, what books do I recommend and what trainings and what what courses and what webinars and I I always uh, answer the same and they they the they think that I'm rude to them, but I always say, 
forget books, forget webinars, pick a project, work on them, and start learning by doing. And uh, they 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 think that uh, I am rude to them, and I don't want to uh, say a golden secret to them. But there is no secret. There are no shortcuts. There are no cutting corners. Uh, we need to we need to work to to learn. So pick a project and work on them and enjoy life and happy designing, as uh, as Sean Himmel said. Exactly, and I think that's a that's a good note to to end on. I'm totally behind both of you. That's that's definitely uh, the approach. I've I've learnt most of my my <laughs> my skills by doing something wrong. And uh, one last message that's coming in is the Power Conversion Limited have uh, also said, don't forget, Peter is the KeyCAD guy. So um, yeah, Thank a little you. bit of love and recognition from the from the community out there as well. And I think that's that's the that's the thing. That's the reason I do this show. Uh, the community's out there. We we need to work together and, and learn from each other. I don't see people struggling to be seen as the best engineer on the market. Uh, it's all give and take and, and trade offs, uh, which is exactly the the challenges. How we tackle the challenges we face on a daily basis uh, in the uh, the engineering work that lands on our workbenches. So, Frantisek, Peter, thank you ever so much for joining me today. I really appreciate the exchange of information and uh, hope we've managed to uh, uh, provide our audience with lots of information around hardware design and working with freelancers. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. So, well, that is all we have time for in this episode. So, what did we learn? I think one of the key things we've seen today is that working with freelancers can provide you with access to new technologies, new capabilities, and even offload your own team. But one of the most important things is to get that requirements specif specification correct. Um, regardless of whether you work with freelancers before or developed hardware yourself, the most important thing is write down as much as you can, provide as much inf insight and information as possible and freelancers like Peter and Frantisek will be there to guide you through the rest of the process. Component availability is clearly improving, but it is also an important consideration. So don't be surprised if your partner comes back to you and says it makes sense to get some of those components ordered early. But both, uh, both my guests today have said that you know, they keep an eye on the market, what's going on, and the distributor is also very good at providing availability information. career in electronics engineering, like my guests, you're going to have to get hands on and learn by making a few mistakes. Reading books and testing ideas, attending courses and looking at webinars and doing simulations is part of it, but it's not all of the learning process. My thanks go out today to my experts Petr Dvorak and Frantisek Trubovsky. You've delivered us with some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of the industry trends this year, take a look at News Bytes, our monthly 15 minute show. Please like, subscribe to Electoral TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet or reach out to me, Stuart Cording on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining. Stay in touch and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions. <laughs>